Good morning, everybody. Uh, today we're back in the book of Daniel, and today we move into Daniel chapter 2. <gasps> Exciting! Um, as you know, we have spent quite a bit of time in Daniel chapter 1, and in Daniel chapter 1, we have very much been looking and establishing the character of Daniel uh, and his relationship with the living God. We've talked about how Daniel has trusted God, we've talked about how Daniel has been following God's instructions. We've been talking about how Daniel has been walking with God, building his relationship with the, with the living God, and his character has been formed that. And it's very important that we established in Daniel chapter 1 the character of Daniel, because everything that we read about later on in the book of Daniel is based on that character that has been formed out of his relationship with the living God. And he's not done that alone, because he's done that with his friends, Hananiah, Mishael, and Azariah, because they have shared those same values, those same passions, and their relationship with the living God to trust him, to follow his instructions, and to walk with him. And that's the same with us, isn't it? Our character is formed through our relationship with the living God, through Jesus Christ, and that character and that relationship forms the basis of everything that we do and everything that we say. And we don't do that alone. We do it in the context of our brothers and sisters in Christ who also share those passions that we have to trust Him, to follow His instructions, and to walk with Him. So turn with me, if you have your Bibles, to Daniel chapter 2. And we're just not, we're not going to read the whole chapter because it's a very, very long chapter. It's uh, somewhere in the region of 49 verses, and we're not going to get through all of it. Um, and we're just going to read a portion of it. But let me just set a little bit of context. So we are in the second year of Nebuchadnezzar's reign, and Nebuchadnezzar has a dream that troubles him. And so he calls all the wise men, the people of learning, they, it lists them here as uh, magicians, enchanters, sorcerers, and astrologers. That was just a general term that they used for the people of learning in, uh, in Babylon. And he asks them, well, you guys are the wise people. You tell me what I dreamed and tell me what it means. And of course, they all went, <laughs> you've got to be kidding. How am I supposed to know your dreams? And he says, no, <laughs> you're just buying yourself some time. Tell me, your, tell me the dream and tell me, um, tell me the interpretation. And if you don't do that, then I'm going to chop you into pieces. What a lovely man. And, uh, but if you do, then I'll display great riches on you. So they eventually say, look, no one can do this. And so we'll pick up the story in um, verse uh, uh, 11, uh, verse 12, um, after the, the, the wise people says that what the king asks is too difficult. Nobody can do this. We'll pick up in verse 12, and it says, this made the king so angry and furious that he ordered the execution of all the wise men of Babylon. So the decree was issued to put the wise men to death, and men were sent to look for Daniel and his friends to put them to death. When Arioch, the commander of the king's guard, had gone out to put to death the wise men of Babylon, Daniel spoke to him with wisdom and tact. He asked the king's officer, why did the king issue such a harsh degree? Decree, sorry. Not a degree. Arioch then explained the matter to Daniel. At this, Daniel went into the king and asked for time so that he might interpret the dream for him. Then Daniel returned to his house and explained the matter to his friends, Hananiah, Mishael, and Azariah. He urged them to plead for mercy from the God of heaven concerning this mystery so that he and his friends might not be executed with the rest of the wise men of Babylon. 
During the night, the mystery was revealed to Daniel in a vision. Then Daniel praised the God of heaven and said, Praise be to the name of God forever and ever. Wisdom and power are his. He changes times and seasons. He sets up kings and disposes them. He gives wisdom to the wise and knowledge to the discerning. He reveals deep and hidden things. He knows what lies in darkness and light dwells with him. I thank and praise you, O God of my fathers. You have given me wisdom and power. You have made known to me what we asked of you. You have made known to us the dream of the king. Then Daniel went to Arioch, whom the king had appointed to execute the wise men of Babylon, and said to him, Do not execute the wise men of Babylon. Take me to the king, and I will interpret his dream for him. Arioch took Daniel to the king at once and said, I have found a man among the exiles from Judah who can tell the king what his dream means. The king asked Daniel, also called Belteshazzar, are you able to tell me what I saw in my dream and interpret it? Daniel replied, no, wise man, enchanter, magician, or diviner, can explain the king the mystery he has asked about, but there is a God in heaven who reveals mysteries. And we'll stop there. Amen. Now, last time, we talked about the subject of pursuing spiritual gifts, and we're going to be staying on the theme of spiritual gifts today, but we're going to be talking about some principles around how we can identify, develop, and operate spiritual gifts as we find in the story of Daniel that we've just read together. And before I get started, I just want to say thank you to the feedback and the encouragements from the last time that we spoke on this subject. And I'm excited by what God is going to do among us as we pursue Him and pursue His love, His love for us and His love expressed to others through the gifts that He has given to us. And when we talk about spiritual gifts, we have to always remember that we're talking about all of the gifts. Because I think sometimes we can box, when we talk about spiritual gifts, into just those gifts that are the kind of signs and wonder type stuff, the the prophecies, the healings. And these are great, and don't get me wrong, we need them, but we need all of the gifts because all of the body is required And so we need the gifts also of mercy, we need gifts of administration, we need gifts of giving, we need gifts of hospitality, we need gifts of everything. So when we talk about these principles, please bear in mind that we're not just talking about, the, the, if you like, the upfront stuff, but we're also talking about behind the scenes stuff. Because we always have to remember what Paul says in 1 Corinthians chapter 12, that those that we think less honorable we should treat with special honor. Because while it's important that gifts are expressed and give those signs and wonders, because they are signs that Jesus is alive, and they make people wonder, who is this Jesus? We also need those other gifts of the body that keep the body operating in love and expressing love. Remember, spiritual gifts are not ours. They're given to us by Jesus. They're gifts of grace, and they're gifts used to serve the Lord. And they're also gifts that are an expression of His love for us, but also an expression of His love for others through us. It's God at work in us and through us. So when we talk about these um, principles, then please make sure that we remember that we're talking about all of the gifts. So what's principle number one? Well, principle number one is that you don't need to be qualified. (laughs) Now, we started Daniel chapter two, and the first thing it says, it says, in the second year of Nebuchadnezzar's reign, Nebuchadnezzar had some dreams that troubled him. And you think, wait a minute, are we only in the second year? I thought in Daniel chapter one, he took... Daniel and his friends from Jerusalem and put them into Babylon. I thought they went into a three-year training program 
And then they entered into the service of the king. But we're now in year two. How does that work? Have we gone back in time? Well, I think we have. Because Daniel chapter one is about establishing the character of Daniel and his friends, but primarily Daniel. We've seemed to have gone back in time into year two. And that's supported by the fact that why was Daniel not present? Why was Daniel and his friends not present when the king brought all the wise people in to... Why was Daniel not there? Because Daniel was still in training. He wasn't, if you like, qualified. But yet he is the one that brings what the dream means and what the interpretation means because of his relationship with the living God. And I just love this. Because when it comes to spiritual gifts, we don't need to be qualified. We don't need to have a theological degree. We don't need to have a certain title in the church. We, and if you're sitting there thinking, well, I'm not qualified to have spiritual gifts, you've just qualified yourself because there is no qualification needed. Isn't that brilliant? Because they are gifts of grace. We don't deserve them, but he has given them to us simply because he loves each and every one of us. And that's a wonderful thing. Thank you, Jesus, that you, if you like, you've qualified me because I'm your child. That's the qualification because we have that relationship with Jesus that qualifies us to receive spiritual gifts. So we don't need a qualification as the world defines it. We just need to know and love the Lord Jesus Christ as our Savior. Because when, if we don't always remember that we don't need qualified, then we start to get into mindsets that think to ourselves, well, this is my gift. This is my gift. And when that starts to happen, we then generate pride. And God resists the proud. So we always have to remember that this isn't about us. This isn't about my gift. I'm not, as soon as I start to think I'm qualified for this, then that we've lost the first principle. We always have to remember that God, this is a gift. And we always have to remain humble before him in thanksgiving and gratitude to the Lord who has given us these gifts because God gives grace to the humble. Do I feel qualified to stand here before you? No, I don't. But I do feel very humbled that God has asked me to serve him in this way and hopefully something of his love will be expressed through me to you. It's the same thinking about in the prayer meeting before the service. You know, people were putting out cups and preparing coffee and doing all these kind of things. Do they feel qualified to do that? No, but they are serving the Lord. And hopefully something of his love will be expressed to us through their service. That's what spiritual gifts is all about. And all of us are different. All of us express what he has given to us in different ways. We can't all do the same thing, but we're all encouraged to serve him out of that humility of heart, recognizing that it's not us, but God at work in us and through us. So principle number one is that we don't need to be qualified. Principle number two, we have to overcome or we have to activate our faith over fear. And this is probably one of the biggest areas that we struggle with, or I struggle with anyway. When we read that Nebuchadnezzar basically said, you know, that's it, kill them all. And Arioch, the captain of the guard, goes out and looks for Daniel and his friends to kill him. Now, quite rightly, Daniel doesn't seem to be particularly afraid at this point. He kind of asks Arioch, you know, why? 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 Why is the king doing this? I wasn't even there. Why is he doing this? And I guess he's got a right to know why he's about to be killed. And in that moment, Arioch tells him, and Daniel finds out the real reason. It wasn't just because the king was angry. It was he was angry. But the real root issue was that he was troubled. 
He had a dream and it troubled him and he didn't know what, what it meant. And he wanted someone to tell him what the dream was and what it meant. That was his need. And in the moment that Daniel identified that need, he made a choice to activate faith. Because the next line that we read is that he then went into the king. So he obviously had a conversation with the king, uh, with Ariok, to say, take me to the king. He bought some more time saying, I'll interpret the dream for him. Now, at this point, he hadn't prayed. At this point, he didn't know what the dream was. But he activated faith. Why did he activate faith? Because he knew that God was able. He knew that he served a God that was able to make the impossible possible. And I started to think about this. And I thought, if Daniel had responded in fear in self-doubt, or insecurity, or just went, oh well, thanks for letting me know, right, I'm ready, stick it to me. If he just said, well, that's it, that's the way it is, instead of responding with faith and saying, actually, I can't do anything about this, but I know a God who is, because he knew that need, I wonder we wouldn't have had anything else take place in the book of Daniel, because Daniel would have been killed. But we have all these prophecies, we have all these things that Daniel went through that we can learn from because he activated faith over fear. And I thought to myself, Lord, how many times have I been faced with a need before me? And I've just gone, oh well, I suppose that's the way it is. I suppose that's just how it is. I'll just accept that that's the way it is. As opposed to saying, actually, I know a God that's able to meet that need. I know a God that's able to make that possible. And how much has been lost and has impacted other people's lives because I failed to activate my faith in the God that I know is able to meet needs. How many people have got needs here today? How many people are troubled by something? Either in our families or in our personal lives, or troubled by things in our nation or in internationally? How much of those needs do we just go, oh well, I suppose that's it. I can't do anything about it. Daniel teaches us we need to activate our faith and belief that we know a God that's able to meet those needs. We know a God that's able to meet those needs to make the, pos the impossible possible. And I really felt the challenge of God when I was preparing for this, that this is one of the main things that the Holy Spirit wants to highlight to us. We have to remember to activate our faith and belief that we know a God that's able. You know, I could probably stand here and ask the question, how many believe that God is able to do something, make the, the impossible possible? We could probably all say, amen, yes, we believe that. But when it comes to our need, when it comes to a need that we see, do we have that same response? Or do we just go, oh well, they're there now, I suppose. Or do we activate our faith and say, we're going to do something about this. We're going to activate our faith and say that God is able to meet that need. And that's what Daniel did. And he did that because of his relationship with the living God. Because what casts out fear? Perfect love. And because Daniel was rooted and grounded in the love of God, he was able to have that faith because he knew who God was and he knew what God was able to do. Principle number three, prayer. These two are very much intertwined. As soon as Daniel activated faith, as he declared, I'll, I'll know a God that's able to do this, he then asked his friends to pray. And isn't it wonderful that the revelation from God came through prayer? It came as a result of prayer. Not just his own prayer, but he got his friends around him. 
There's a need. This is a need. Please, we need to pray about this because it's so important. If we don't, it's, it's a matter of life and death. Sometimes we don't see need in that kind of priority. And he got his friends to pray. And praise God, the revelation from God came as a result of prayer. Because when it comes to identifying, developing, and spiritual gifts, there's not a 10-week course that tells you how to do it. It's not a set, set of formulas. It's listening and hearing God. I think this is where Daniel discovered that he was given the spiritual gift of dreams and interpretation of visions and dreams is in that moment. All he knew was that God was able. He didn't have that, he didn't know he had that gift, but he asked God, and God gave him it. And he heard God, and he responded, and he went in to see the king. And we'll talk about that um, dream and what it means uh, next time. But those, that activation of our faith and prayer are very much intertwined. You know, I, I love the fact that, you know, we're talking through, prayer isn't just about talking to God, but it's listening to Him as well. And we talked, Karen touched on that a little bit earlier. And I hope that you're also appreciating the stuff that we're going through in the U version, daily version on where Pete Gregg's talking about how to hear God. Because what's so vital for identifying, developing and operating in spiritual gifts is our ability to hear God. Because that's the key. It's not a formula, it's not a model, it's a relationship and listening to what God is saying and then acting on it. And the fourth principle was um, glory goes to Jesus or glory goes to God. You know, I love how Daniel responds when he receives that revelation. We see that, we, we see that personal praise Praise be to the name of the God forever and ever and ever. I thank you and praise you, O God of my fathers. You have made known to me what we asked of you. Daniel gives praise and glory to God personally, and he also gives praise and glory to God publicly. Because he says to the king, no man can do this, but there is a God in heaven who is able to reveal mysteries. So when we talk about spiritual gifts and identifying, developing, operating in spiritual gifts, we always have to remember that as we build this, these principles into our life, then He will bring it about, that keeping humble before Him, knowing that it's not us, it's His gift to us. Always remembering, you know, to activate our faith, to believe that God is able, prayer, listening to him, and then acting on what he says to us, and then always giving the glory to him personally and publicly. And as we do these things, God will bring it about, but it's in response to needs. There's so many needs among us. There's so many needs in our community. We need to see the need, and we need to activate our faith and pray and ask the Lord to do what does he want us to do to help meet that need and that could be anything all the spiritual gifts are available in some ways we maybe don't have one maybe we all have a bit of everything because we have the Holy Spirit we have Jesus in our life and he is the one that makes a difference but it's based on that foundation of love that foundation of our relationship with Jesus. You know, when we look at the Acts of the Apostles, and I'm coming to a close, so don't worry. Uh, when we look at the Acts of the Apostles, I love how they, at the end of chapter 2, they, sorry, the end of chapter 4, they were before the Sanhedrin, they were told, you know, don't you ever again talk in the name of Jesus? You know, don't do that. In the, don't do that. Not allowed. And they went, they brought the believers together, they went in and they had a prayer meeting. And they prayed, now, Lord, consider their threats. Enable your servants to speak your word with boldness. Stretch out your hand to heal and perform miracles through the name of your holy servant, Jesus. In response to the need, 
they activated faith. They prayed for boldness. And sometimes we need to be bold when it comes to activating our faith. They prayed, and obviously, through the Acts of the Apostles, we see the outworking of that, and it brings glory to Jesus. That's what we want to see happen in our community, in this city. And he's able to do it. And he uses us to do it. We might not think we're qualified. Well, praise God, we've met the first criteria, because we're not. But God in his grace enables us and gives us everything that we need in order to meet the needs of the community. If we would only remain humble before him, activate our faith, keep praying, and keep giving the glory and the honor to the Lord Jesus. You know, when we were talking about these four principles, I thought, well, there's no one better, there's no greater example than actually the example of Jesus. Because he humbled himself. There was a need that was greater than any need in the world. The need for us to be forgiven and reconciled to God. That was the greatest need. And he, if you like, activated faith. He said, God, you're able to do it. Use me. <laughs> he prayed in the Garden of Gethsemane, Lord, if there's any way this cup can be taken from me, yet not my will, but your will be done. And of course, we know that on the cross, he prayed, glorify your son. On the Gethsemane, sorry, he prayed, Lord, you have glorified your son, now glorify your son. And now, after his death, burial, and resurrection, and ascension, he is now the one that is glorified. And I thought, you know, there's no greater example than the example of Jesus. You know, he met our greatest need out of love. He humbled himself. He made himself available to be used. He made himself available. And he took all our punishment on himself. And he died for us so that we can know this wonder of knowing his love and know this wonder of being his children. And he asks us to follow his example. He asks us to humble ourselves. He asks us to make ourselves available, knowing that God is able. He asks us to pray, not our will, but yours be done. And he asks us to glorify him. We're going to spend some time in communion. And as we partake of these elements, let's remember what Jesus has done for us. It's only because of what he has done for us that we have this enormous privilege of being able to be available to him and be used by him to meet the needs of those around us. And we won't have time during the service, but if there is anyone here that has a need and that needs prayer, then I want to say right now, God is able to meet the need. And I believe that God will, able to, will be able to meet needs today. So if there is someone in here that has a need, then after the service, please come uh, after the service is finished and we'll spend some time and we'll pray and we'll believe that God is able to meet that need together. Mm -hmm.